Hello and welcome. My name is Emily Robles and I'm an Academic Operations Manager here at UAGC. I will be your host of this session. The Triangle of Fear Meets the Ancient Pyramid. How specific fears collide with motivation and why Maslow's Pyramid may actually be a sailboat. By joining us today, you acknowledge that this session is being recorded and will be shared with the TLC-related materials. Microphones will be muted for this presentation, but we encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat. Also, we have enabled live transcription. If you would like to use it, click the live transcription button at the bottom of your Zoom window. I would like to take a moment to introduce our co-presenters, Dr. Nancy DeVore and Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. Nancy DeVore is a business consultant and associate faculty member at UAGC in the College of Arts and Science in the Department of Behavioral Sciences. She teaches industrial organizational psychology with an interest in bridging the gap between online learning and real life. She holds a PhD from Capella University in general psychology and specialized in the experience of inspired change and how chance encounters can move people toward their higher purpose and unlock possibilities. Our special featured guest is Dr. Barry Kauf Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is, co is cognitive scientist and hum humanistic psychologist specializing in human potential. He is the founder of Center for Human Potential and founder of Self-Actualization Coaching. Dr. Kaufman has authored 10 books, including Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization, a best-selling book on groundbreaking topics based on his study of motivation and the work of Abraham Maslow while he attended Yale. He has taught courses at Columbia, Yale, and NYU. Dr. Kaufman, also host of the Psychology Podcast, which has received over 30 million downloads and was included in Business Insider, list of nine podcasts that will change how you think about human behavior. Dr. Kaufman is interested in using his research to help others live a creative, fulfilling, and self-actualized life. He is one of the top 20 cited scientists studying intelligence, and in 2015, he was named one of 50 groundbreaking scientists who are changing the way we see the world by Business Insider. This week, Dr. Kaufman was included in a list of published by Stanford University of the World's Top 2% Scientists list. Now, Nancy, tell us about what you will be presenting with Dr. Kaufman. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you for such great introductions of us. And Scott Barry Kaufman is someone that I met on X, formerly known as Twitter, the more he posted, the more I leaned in. And when he published his book, Transcend the New Science of Self-Actualization in 2020, I was immediately drawn to his work in humanistic psychology and the work of Abraham Maslow that's covered in his book. It was like a big light went on. And given all that was going on in 2020, remember no toilet paper and we're all gonna die. <laughs> given all of that, uh, his it just made his work stand out even more to me. I'm definitely on the same wavelength as him. Uh, he will share on some of his work and how it relates to you as a university-based audience. The way this presentation emerged is based on some comments that I received from students on the fear of success. I hadn't heard that before, so I listened a little closely. I noticed it seemed like students were worried about uh, and worried in different ways, and that, that worry or fear that they had seemed to be hidden, it wasn't very obvious. For example, students who were really high performers appeared to be worried about what's next and what their role is in what's next. I wanted to find out more about fears of adult learners in case there was something I could do to help in the course that I was teaching. What I found in my preliminary search is that there are three types of fears described in science and in media. One is the fear of success, the second is the fear of failure, and the third is imposter syndrome. Each have their own unique characteristics. Fear of success, 
this is just having anxiety about the change that success can bring to one's life. If someone's been told that they're not capable of learning at a college level or that it breaks the family rules or culture about self-expansion, one might attempt to sabotage the effort. So it's not really going to be worth it if I go for the success because I'll just be excluded from everything that matters to me. And so they might sabotage their own learning efforts um, just so they don't rock the boat or bring on some rejection from their family or their social circle. Fear of failure is a little different. And for adult learners, it can be that they scare themselves into performing because the company's paying for the tuition and they better perform, or they may have to pay for the course if, if they don't perform. Fear of failure it can also be hard for adults who haven't had very much experience with being their own self-agent, with their decisions and actions, and where they think autonomously and independently, especially if they see other people acting uniquely and independently, they might think, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. The other one is imposter syndrome. Uh, it's received a lot of attention lately because it describes some unique experiences of second guessing one's skills and talents, doubting that one is able to finish the course, finish the degree, uh, or step into the next career opportunity. This type of fear can morph into impression management, oh, I better look good so that they know I, I'm not actually afraid. And this can lead to acting and speaking in ways that help them to overcompensate. And that doesn't work out so well in the classroom or in the workplace. But Stephanie is going to help us with a quick poll. Um, Stephanie Adams is our behind the scene tech host and she's gonna ask about what type of fears of these three or which of these three are really the most common. Oh, no, actually, yeah, she was going to do um, more than one question. Um, have you seen these fears in others? Yeah, so we see it all around us all the time, right? But we, we don't really put any kind of um, thought organization around it so that we can... Um, maybe be of help to somebody that's experiencing it or where I myself could find help if I'm experiencing it. The second poll question here is, um, of these three, which one do you think is the most common? Yeah, fear of failure is definitely one that I felt when I was in school and that I even feel like on the job when I'm consulting or when I'm teaching here at U UAGC. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, these fears can be exhausting. They can interrupt motivation. The theme of our con conference is working towards yes, open access is innovation in higher education culture. And this conference poses the question, does the culture of higher education need a new paradigm? So this presentation offers some ideas about the human centric side of higher education by being aware of different types of fears um, that adult students may have that are really fueled by learned bias and intrusive thoughts of what they might lose if they complete their study or program and or if they gain in their um, place of employment. Scott Berry's work is important. It highlights new information. And I've been sharing Scott Berry Kaufman's work with my students since 2020, since we met. When I read his book, um, among the topics that I teach 
our motivation theories. And his book does such a great job of describing <laughs> um, uh, the different um, way of looking at motivation. And I'm sharing this slide because it's a um, diagram from the textbook that I use. So can we, is it possible to remove the pool from the? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't, I don't know how to remove it. Um, <clears throat> Hey. Nancy, you should be able to remove it on your end. Uh, maybe click the X. Uh, I had it on yeah, my screen, I don't, and I just, I don't I just, see I, it. I, I yeah. Just, see, because I'm sharing my screen as a host, it's not giving me that X. <laughs> I think that each participant has to exit out of their own screen. Okay, but I'm not able to do that because I'm the host. Can yeah, you drag, I won't it, let drag it to the corner of your screen, like just out of the way, at least. Yeah. Yeah, it, it won't, won't let, let me, me do anything. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. And I can't remove it either. Better. Uh, we don't see it on our end, Nancy, just so you know if that if that's comforting at all. That is comforting. <laughs> <laughs> we see the full slides uh, on our end. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, when discussing Maslow's theory, I routinely would suggest to students that there's more to Maslow's work that's different than um, the diagram. But it's not letting me go back. And the pyramid diagram was developed by a management consulting firm in the 1960s, and it was widely adopted as a visual explanation for how the motivation process is experienced. And it looks like an organizational chart, and therefore it was widely accepted and used in higher education. But Maslow didn't really intend for the theory to suggest that it happens in stages. And here's why Scott Berry Kaufman's work matters. Maslow's work and also new findings in neuroscience suggest that we can work on multiple needs for motivation at once that lead to um, work on them simultaneously and not necessarily in stages. Scott Barry Kaufman suggested that a more correct diagram might include a sailboat. The metaphor of opening one's sail to accommodate safety and connection, self-esteem, exploration, love and purpose may suggest a more accurate view of Maslow's theory. And as a researcher, I go to the original source and I had the audacity to contact the author of this idea directly and invite him here to share more of his paradigm breaking work with all of you. So Scott, Barry Kaufman, what do we need to know about moving from uh, motivational pyramids to sailboats? Hey, thanks, Nancy. Uh, and thanks everyone for having me here today. Um, before I before I jump into the whole sailboat, I want to give a little bit of background about myself and uh, why I'm so interested in this topic. Uh, if you could advance the slide, maybe I'll, I'll say the word next, and uh, that'll, that'll mean advance the slide. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes uh, from the humanistic psychology, Abraham Maslow. We try to make a rose into a good rose rather than to seek to change roses into lilies. It necessitates a pleasure in the self-actualization of a person who may be, who may be quite different from yourself. It even implies an ultimate respect and acknowledgement of the sacredness and uniqueness of each kind of person. Next. Uh, just real quick, uh, for me personally, uh, I've been interested in human potential and um, and uh, and unlocking the hidden potential of all students since since uh, my earliest years of life. Um, I was diagnosed with a learning disability, an auditory learning disability, and I was placed in remedial classes. But I 
just felt like all the kids uh, around me, uh, my friends in the special education classroom were capable of a lot more. And I became their advocates. And then I eventually became my own self-advocate um, in ninth grade when I took myself out uh, of special ed. And I told my school system that I wanted to see what I was actually capable of. I wanted them to stop telling me what I was capable of. And I wanted to see what I was capable of. And that really set me on off on a journey of learning and discovery. Um, it's it's a long story, <laughs> but um, I, I don't have much time here today. But um, long story short, I when I got to college and I discovered there was a whole science of uh, well intelligence. First, I started off in the field of studying human intelligence. I, I just felt so excited because it felt like such a good match to uh, what I wanted to do in life, which was to unlock people's potential. Um, if you could go next. Um, I, I, I came up, uh, if you could, uh, go next slide. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> next slide. Next slide. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, in, in my thinking about human intelligence, I'm um, starting to think about human potential more broadly, uh, and realized, well, intelligence is only one small part of potential. Um, we, the way, best way to thinking about potential is, is not uh, as some fixed quantity that we discover at age two and then it's uh for the rest of your life we get we, we we pigeonhole you in a certain box instead i like to think of potential as a constantly moving target and i think the more we engage in something the more potential grows and the more um our potential grows the more we're motivated to want to be engaged in it i really think the best way of thinking about potential is readiness for engagement um if we really redefined potential in that way you know it'd mean all sorts of things it'd mean it'd mean kids could move in and out of gifted education classrooms they can move in and out of special ed classrooms uh, you know the kids in the in the what in, in, in what's mainstream education called i don't know is there a word for that uh non-special education i just invented a term for it non-special <laughs> education um uh they you know like that they don't feel particularly like they're winning <laughs> so um really uh allowing for this uh dynamic conceptualization of potential uh, next, uh, yes, our standard predictive models of success and life outcomes won't hold. Next, uh, there's so much I would I would like to acknowledge and stuff I'd love to share with you today that I've studied the past 20 years, but I I'm just flying by. My whole life is flying by in five slides. Okay, um, capacity versus competence. Uh, really uh, trying to plot out um, the, the the predictor of uh, even achievement, like standardized test achievement, and you find that uh, standard models of potential really uh, miss out on a lot of students. Um, you can just take my word for it with this graph. <laughs> Next. Um, yeah, so I do think we need to distinguish in competence and capacity. Um, I think a lot of people have competence that has far surpassed our predicted capacity that we predicted to them. But there are a lot of other factors that affect uh, academic competence. Uh, next, let's get all the factors on the screen at once. Let's just get them all on the screen. Uh, academic intrinsic motivation, self-control, active learning strategies, cognitive stimulating home environment, self-control, self-regulation, emotional intelligence, and social supports in the classroom. All these factors I care about and I've been studying. Next. Um, so yeah, I define self-actualizing intelligence as a, as uh, that is involving the dynamic interplay of engagement and ability in the pursuit of personal goals. To me, this is a, a better, um, a more practical definition of intelligence than our standard metrics of intelligence, which play a role, uh, an important role, uh, but uh, self-actualizing actualizing intelligence allows all students to live long and prosper. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> next. <laughs> Um, so I really have been arguing towards a human-centered education system, one that uh, recognizes really a whole person approach that tackles various needs. And I've uh, redefined Maslow's hierarchy of needs for the 21st century. Um, it's uh, the, the, the um, yeah, yeah, Nancy already said this. <laughs> the, the, the pyramid has, the pyramid has got to go. <laughs> next, next. Yeah, let's next. Ha ha, Wi-Fi joke. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time for jokes. Next. Okay, so I have a okay, sailboat model. Sorry, my... By the way, that was a joke. I don't have time for jokes. That was a yeah. joke. That was called a meta <laughs> joke. <laughs> uh, uh, Nancy, did you say something? Sorry. No, I, I just wanted to let you know that my, my computer was thinking about advancing. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so it did it automatically? No, it didn't do it automatically, but it took its its time. <laughs> oh, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, yeah. So the opposite. Yeah. Um. So a sailboat, I think, is a better metaphor, uh, for human potential. Next. Um. This is my redefined uh, hierarchy of needs. Um. Uh, so I'm gonna slow down here a second and really f talk about this. So, the 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 idea here is that we have security needs and we have growth needs. When our security needs are not met um, to a certain uh, degree, we can feel like there are holes in the boat, you know, to use the, the sailboat metaphor. We can feel like we're drowning. And it's very hard to move anywhere when you feel like you're drowning. So it is very important that we help people um, in an education system address their needs for safety, their needs for connection, and their needs for um, healthy self-esteem. I distinguish between healthy self-esteem and narcissism. I've been studying narcissism and its various manifestations. There are various kinds of narcissism. There's grandiose narcissism. There's vulnerable narcissism. There's communal narcissism. You know, you ever, do you ever meet someone who's like, I'm the best in the world at helping people. <laughs> You're like, whoa, calm down, bro. Okay. Um, and then when you open the, uh, and when you, when you open the sale, um, you have the growth needs, it, you know, if you, if you just feel a sense of security, you're not going to move, um, you know, ult eventually you have to be vulnerable to the winds and the waves and just life. It's called life folks. Um, and yet you, you have to open that sail in order to, uh, move in the port that you most want to move to. The idea of the sailboat metaphor works at a lot of levels, I think, because the journey of self-actualization is one where you, have to really have a clear image of where you want to sail, but also know that all along that journey, you know, you're constantly shutting down the sail, dealing with your security needs, opening up the sail again, um, dealing with other boats, trying to help other boats to rise the tide for everyone. Doesn't that sound nice? Um, that's the transcendence, you know, and uh, transcendence is a lot of people also don't know this about Abraham Maslow, but the last couple of years of his life, he proposed a whole theory of transcendence. Um, that he argued was higher than self-actualization. So I tried to incorporate all of this, but in a scientific model. You just trust me. This is all. <laughs> that's all I, this is all science. <laughs> you trust me. <laughs> if you want to read my all my papers, you can go to my website. Uh, um, uh, and uh, we really wanted to leave time for Q and A, but go next for a second because um, just to to talk about transcendence for a second and zoom in on transcendence. By the way, I for me in the metaphor transcendence is not the boat it's the it's the view of the seabird um the view of the sea the seabird is able to take any perspective of the boat it can it can it can fly down and be one with the insecurity but it also can rise above and view ourselves from a higher perspective like we can often do in meditation or with certain substances <laughs> you know it can help us do that um so i really um think that healthy transcendence is one that is not where you're above others and some sort of I'm better, I'm enlightened and you're not, you know, everyone knows that everyone has that friend, Mary, who does one weekend yoga retreat and they come back and they cancel half their friends. They say, I'm more enlightened than all my friends. <laughs> you know, I need, I need new friends. No, look, you know, that's not the kind of transcendence I'm talking about. I'm talking about, by the way, no offense if anyone's named Mary here. <laughs> um, but um, the, the, the whole point here is that it's, we're talking about um, not vertical transcendence, but horizontal transcendence, the kind of transcendence where you are one with the world, not you are above the world, but you, uh, what Maslow calls it a synergy, where what is good for you is good for others automatically. You know, um, we support your being and, and growth as a whole person, because by doing that, you will not only develop into a whole person, but the world will benefit automatically. There's nothing else added or required. That's the most beautiful form of transcendence that I am talking about. And I think I, you know, how often in an educational context do you hear an educator talking about the importance of transcendence? <laughs> Not often. I'm going to answer that question. Not often, uh, or even self-actualization. But I, I've been, uh, I'm working towards a uh, program for educators um, where teachers view themselves as self-actualization coaches. I actually have a uh, three-day uh, thing in December, December eighth or tenth, um, uh, and uh, for coaches. But I would love to expand that beyond to help teachers uh, become coaches um, and self-actualization coaches and be able to realize the potential in all their students. So maybe we'll, we have some time for Q&A. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hear the I hear the audience. I can hear the applause. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's there. <laughs> Definitely there. Well, I just loved how you broke down the well-worn diagrams of the past. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> and, Nancy. Uh, I'm you glad so I'm not supportive. the only voice on that. Definitely not. But I wanted to open it up for questions uh, while we still have some time. Wow, Jessica Kohler is here. I've been following her Psychology Today blog for like 20 years. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to give her a shout out. So, Emily, do we have any questions in the chat? I'm not seeing any. No questions. I could have I could have slowed down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. DeVore and Dr. Kaufman. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for attending today's session. We do encourage you to continue throughout the day. There's more sessions to come, and we hope that everyone enjoys the rest of TLC. Thank you very much, Emily. Thanks. And thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Yeah, thank you.